we turn to study God's Word together, uh, and this passage made me think about how, uh, how often I'm surprised at how my children imitate me. Does, do any other parents feel that way? <laughs> yeah, Monique, I hear you. See, sometimes I, I'm really surprised by this. I mean, my kids have my, partially my genetic makeup. Uh, my kids partially, to a degree, have my personality traits. To a degree, they, they reflect me in a lot of different ways, including my propensity to a particular brand of brokenness, right? Um, and in their natural selves, they're just kind of like me to some degree, maybe 50% or so. Um, and they learn from me even when I don't teach them. Um, now, this is a sword that cuts both ways. Because sometimes my children imitate me and it's humbling and it's honoring and I feel dignified in the ways that they have imitated me. But the sword cuts both ways. Even when I'm not teaching them, they're imitating me. And sometimes I'm humbled uh, for different reasons. I'm humbled by the ways that they reflect my particular form of brokenness and my particular broken style of relating. And that's, that's really humbling for me. Um, you see, sometimes those kids, they just hold up a mirror, uh, practically speaking, in my face and say, hey, check it out. This is, this is what I'm imitating. And so isn't it true, though, that children just imitate their parents, whether we want them to or not? Um, I, I want to name that because this passage calls us as followers of Christ to imitate our daddy, our father in heaven. Um, we're called to imitate him as his children and the most concise way we do this is found at the very last part of this, this passage. And this is going to be kind of an anchor for us uh, as we study God's Word today. It says this, Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave Himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Now, this section of Ephesians that we're about to study together is kind of like a commentary on the very previous section. And so this, this section... This teaching is titled, New Creations in Christ Live New Lives, and this is part two, because the first section last week was part one. So we're just going to walk through this passage, um, but first I'm going to pray for us. So please pray with me as we study God's Word. Lord, uh, we come into this space, we come in different places and in different ways, but we're singing the same songs, and you, the Spirit that reads us as we read you in your Word, Lord, you are attending to us in different ways. Lord, we trust that you are working restoration and renewal and redemption. Father, we would pray those things in Ukraine. We would pray for that nation that is under oppression and attack. Lord, we would pray those things throughout the world and that you would make your kingdom come. Lord, we would pray for us and for the world that you would comfort and disrupt for the sake of the gospel always for your glory, always for our growth, always for your kingdom going forth. We pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read last week's passage because it's part one, and then we're going to read the next section, this week's passage, part two. This is Ephesians 4, verses 17 and following. It says this, Now I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk, which means live, as the Gentiles do, in their futility of their minds. They're darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, which is due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way that you learned Christ or heard the gospel, assuming that you have heard about Him and were taught in Him, as the truth is in Jesus, here's the gospel that you were taught, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on like a garment the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. <clears throat> Let's take a break. That's part one, the call to take off and put on. Part two, New Creations in Christ, a little commentary. Let's read it. It says this, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down in your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. 
Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as it fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed off for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God and Christ forgave you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. What I see in this passage is four specific ways of living new lives as new creations in Christ. I'm going to walk us through them. The first one is this. New creations in Christ speak the truth. I see that in verse 25. It says this, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of the other. What is being denounced? What's being denounced? Falsehood. It's in the past tense. Having taken off falsehood, literally it means taking off lies. And there is a reasoning given. The reasoning given is because we're all members one of the other. Now, We've been studying the book of Ephesians. We've been brought together. We've been united together. And we've been called to live in interdependence with one another in such a way that we're actually responsible for one another. So what that means is that neglecting that responsibility is not just neglecting the person that perhaps needs truth, but it's also a disregard for the community. It's also a disregard for your individual self because you're interdependent with the community. You see this. The word falsehood means lying. The most easiest way for us to understand that is the intentional deception or leading someone away from the truth, right? But isn't there a way to not live in the truth without saying a single word? Avoidance. Silence. Pretending like all is well. Perhaps it's seeing sin, dysfunction, addictive personality things, perhaps uh, experiencing a lack of general relational peace and accord and saying and doing nothing about it. Now, we just ask these couple questions here. Is that living in the truth? Is, is that loving our neighbor? Is that embracing the interdependence of the body? I think those are all rhetorical no's. See, our sin and our story as individuals has a way of training us and um, causing us to think and react and, and, and do things in particular ways that has the ability to blind us. We have the ability and the tendency to, in fact, not just deceive the world out here, but to really deceive ourselves. And that's the, that's the greater danger here for us uh, that we should be aware of. That sin in itself, we talked about this last week, sin has, has a way of hardening us and callousing us and desensitizing us. Um, and that's one of the ways that the deceiver, Satan, actually deceives, is that sin has a way of perpetuating deception within us. So it's so important for us as a community to to live vulnerably in community, confessionally with one another, so that we're not deceived by our sin, hardened and calloused and deceived. Our own stories, the things that have shaped us so so powerfully in our lives, kind of have a way of determining and forming an interpretive grid through which we see the world. Um, You ever heard this expression that if you think of yourself as a nail, everything looks like a hammer? There's a, there's a sense in which our stories kind of give birth to a way that we think about life and see the world. And so it's so important for us to read our stories in community. It's so important for us to live in a vulnerable way where uh, our impactful life and stories um, 
have less of an ability to color in our perceptions and at times perhaps even deceive us. Um, uh, this is a terrifying verse. Uh, it comes from uh, Proverbs chapter 16. It says, There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. I just find that so sobering and terrifying of the way that we can be deceived. I've been deceived in my life, my life in Christ, mind you. I've been deceived uh, several times. Um, and the way that my, my self-deception uh, was revealed and ultimately corrected was through friends speaking the truth in love to me. With words that cut with a kindness, you might say. Um, with words that ultimately brought surgical clarity to situations, ultimately brought health and healing to me and to the community around me. You might ask this question, what is the result of not representing the truth that you may be experiencing, the ways that you may be holding things in? What are the, what are the results of not living in that truthful manner? Here's a couple thoughts. I don't think it's necessarily these things every time, but I think there's a way that we, we go towards resentment. And I think there's a way that um, it destroys relationships and it impacts the community at large. And so it's just so important for us as a gospel community to, to be committed to speaking truth. Um, verse 15 of this, this passage um, is a very famous uh, verse that calls us to speak the truth in love. And that section, it, it shows how immaturity and instability give way to stability and maturity um, as we speak the truth in love and build up the body of Christ. And that works as individuals and that works as the community at large. Um, so here, let me wrap it all up here. Point one, new creations in Christ speak the truth because Christ himself is the truth and always makes truth known. And our anchor verse is be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us. That's point one. Here's, here's what I see this passage tells us in, in the second point, that new creations in Christ give. New creations in Christ give. Look at verse 28. It says this, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. What is being denounced here, church? Okay, stealing. Um, and we might just ask the question, why do thieves steal? Um, this is certainly not always the case, certainly not exhaustive, but here's a couple thoughts on why thieves steal. Laziness is one. Um, desperation, um, impatience, greed. But here's what I think is underlying all of this, that, that theft is ultimately a demonstration of selfishness, of taking uh, and a disregard and a violation of other people. And a rejection of love itself and a love of God. Um, and so Paul commands the thief to no longer steal, and then he gives him a, a really clear reasoning. Here's the reasoning. So that he may have something to share with anyone in need. So ultimately, the thief is called to work and labor to train his body to do what his heart should do, which is put away laziness and impatience and greed, and rather to put on, put on and dress himself with selflessness and the love of people as opposed to the disregard of people. So as opposed to taking selfishly, the thief is called to, 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 to work and to contribute. So it's a complete reversal. So every instance of our lives touched by grace in the gospel sees a way in which the previous life before Christ is, is sometimes very opposite from the life after we've experienced Christ. So this is calling us to release greed through grace. And as we experience the sacrificial grace of Jesus, we begin to release more and more over time these temporary greedy pleasures. Even if we're not thieves, there's ways that we still have that greed. And we see ourselves less and less as owners and consumers and more and more as stewards and givers. So new creations in Christ, they give. Because Christ Himself gave, not His stuff, Christ Himself gave him His very self. And so be imitators of God, as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us. That's point two. 
Two clear imperatives for us. Here's a third one. New creations in Christ build up others with their words. New creations in Christ build up others with their words. Look at verse 29. It says this, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only that which is good for building up, as it fits the particular occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Hey church, what is being denounced here? Yeah, corrupting talk. This is a really fun word in the Greek. I'm not going to tell you what the Greek word is in Greek because that you, you don't know what that is, uh, and I don't either. But here's what here's what the range is of all the things that this word means. It's really fun. We can nerd out on this. It means rotten. It means worthless. It means evil. It means foul. It means abusive. It means unwholesome. It means valueless. It means decaying. It means destroying. It means defaming. What it's basically getting at is the corrupting talk is words that attack and defame the image of God in another person. But rather, only are we called to have words that come out of us that build up as opposed to destroy so that it gives grace to those who hear. Now, James 3 is really helpful here. James has a lot of really great stuff to say. He says this about the dangers of our words and the dangers of our tongue. He says, it's, it's a restless evil, full of deadly poison. And with it, we see incongruence. We see the way that in our mouth and in our words, we bless the Lord our God And also, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. And from the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, this incongruence should not be. New creations in Christ, rather, should build up with their words. See, James gives us two beautiful analogies. He says, yeah, the tongue is really small, but it's really powerful. Much like a large ship, a big boat that is guided by a small rudder. In the same way that such a huge forest fire is started with this tiny, tiny, tiny spark that sets the whole forest ablaze. You see, our words matter. Our words matter. The three most powerful ways to demonstrate love is with your quiet presence when someone is in need, your hands as you offer acts of service and love, perhaps a meal, and with our words. So how do we go about building up with our words? That's a fun conversation for us to maybe have over the next 30 years. Maybe being thoughtful, maybe being intentional, maybe sharing a scripture verse, maybe using our mouth to pray. There's, I mean, those are all great things. Explore the territory. I don't know. Let's, let's do that together. One thing I would suggest is speaking words of dignity and life. What I mean by that is speak to the dignity that we see in one another. And that's not flattery. And when we do that, it's not ingratiating and slimy where we're trying to get something out of somebody. It's authentically naming the image of God in someone that we are experiencing. It might be like this. Thank you for the ways that you serve so faithfully behind the scenes doing setup or leading worship or the ways that you are engaged in discipling our children. It might be saying something like, I really enjoy watching you as a mother. It might be, hey dad, it's really clear how much you love and serve your family by the way that you're always toting around that child. It might be saying something like, you know, I'm really impacted when you share In community group, I'm always so impacted by the way that you share vulnerably or the insights you have in Scripture. You might say, I I leave our conversations encouraged because you always seem to really be listening to me and it makes me feel like I matter. New creations in Christ, we're called to build up with our words because because Christ used His words to build up His people and to build up the kingdom. And in a very literal sense for Christ, to speak it into existence 
can we learn to build up with our words? Be imitators of God, he says, as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us. Fourth thing I see in this passage, new creations in Christ forgive. You might have noticed there was a lot of language in this confession this morning about anger, callousness. It's based on this passage. Verse 26. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity for the devil. We're going to jump down to verse 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away with you from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Hey, church, what's being denounced here? It's not anger. It says, be angry and do not sin. What it's saying is, when you get angry, do not sin. Anger itself is not necessarily a sin. I I think the church corporately is scared of anger because it seems so unchristian. And oftentimes it it demonstrates itself in very unchristian ways. Amen? Okay. We're there. But anger isn't the problem. It's, it's what we do with our anger that is the problem. Anger in itself is actually good. We can and we should bless our anger to learn how to engage it in healthy ways. Now, some people, uh, they get more angry uh, more easily than other people. Um, I got a mood ring on today. I came in the house the other day rocking this, and my wife was like, are you wearing a mood ring? I was like, yeah, girl. I'm bringing them back. And my kids were obsessed with it um, because they're like magic. Um, I was just thinking about how some people have mood rings, their life, you know, their personality, that they, they have no anger colors. They have no bright yellow, orange, or red. And that other people have these really brilliant forms of anger um, that they're in touch with in in really good ways that come out of who they are. Bright yellow and orange and red. These are the prophets among us who are so committed to truth and fairness and rightness and justice and mercy. This is a gift. When they see some form of injustice, whether that's interpersonally or whether it's systemically, their hearts break and ache and they get angry and their anger helps escort them towards action interpersonally or to do something about the injustice and the lack of truth that they see. That is a gift, church. We need that. It leads them to use their words and their energy to make things right. But many sins and many styles of relating do spring up from anger. It says this, Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. This this has a lot to do with the context of relationships. It's basically a picture of not keeping short accounts, of pursuing peacemaking and reconciliation and ultimately forgiveness. A couple questions. What functionally happens when we don't make peace? What functionally happens when we don't make peace? And and when we don't experience reconciliation and forgiveness, what happens? The tendency, I think, is for our anger to turn into resentment and bitterness. Flames of anger turning into icy, cold resentment and contempt. Twisting our own hearts and functionally destroying the relationship. You see, our lack of peacemaking, our lack of reconciliation, our lack of forgiveness, these are opportunities for Satan to show up and do some incredible damage. 
If I was not preaching, I would say amen. Yeah, for, for me, for me. Okay, now you're allowed to do that too. Look at verse 31. It says this, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander take it off along with all malice. Look at these words. Bitterness, wrath, anger. The word anger meaning rage, clamor, slander, malice. How many of these words, how many of these these things are associated with corrupting, defaming, destroying talk? Words that destroy and mar the image of God. I just want to pose a couple lingering questions for my own heart and perhaps for yours that we can chew on over the next 30 years or so. Hey, what is it that you do with your anger? And what opportunity has has Satan taken with your anger? With your resentment? Verse 32. The gospel corrective, if you will. Be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. I just love this language. He says, tender hearted. You just notice tender is the opposite of hard hearted, tender is the opposite of callous hearted. He says, be tender hearted, which is to say impressionable hearted, forgiving one another as Christ and God in Christ forgave you. So, how does God forgive us? He absorbs our sin. He, he punishes the sin that He sees in us on Christ. As our judge, He makes us right with Himself because of what Christ did for us. He unites us with Himself because of Christ absorbing and punishing that sin in that way. We can do that as well. We can be made right with one another through Christ. New creations in Christ forgive. Because Christ forgives us, absorbing in Himself our failures and our sins. And Paul says this, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us. So it's, it's, it's clear we're called to imitate God, our Daddy, and demonstrate the love of Christ through truth, through giving, through building up, and through forgiveness. How are we possibly supposed to do those things? Well, it's really not through trying hard. Branches do not produce fruit by pushing the fruit out. But rather by being connected to the vine, the life source, the gospel source. All of these things are imperatives, which are uh, a fun word for doing stuff. And all of the doing stuff in the Bible is rooted in the gospel. That everything we are called to do is rooted in who we are made in Christ. That we are new creations in Christ. Everything that we're called to give away of ourselves is rooted in what we have received in Christ. So in Christ, we have been forgiven and we receive grace, we receive truth, we receive encouragement, we receive forgiveness. So we don't need to focus on pushing the fruit out. We need to focus on the cross in our personal lives, reading our stories of how Christ has touched us with the gospel and transformed us, and the fruit actually will appear in this journey of life as we live and walk in community, as we seek the Lord's face. So let's pray together. Lord, thank you for these words and how they are so surgical. the surgical nature of these words press upon us the reality that you care about holiness and you care about truth and you would not allow us to be deceived in ourselves. You would not allow us, even in this community, 
to be hardened and calloused by our own ways of deceiving ourselves and perhaps wearing facades. Lord, expose us. Lord, would you change us? Lord, would you continue the work of redemption that that you started and that you will progressively bring to completion? Lord, would you make us more like Jesus? Lord, would you allow us the grace that we can be your image bearers in this world? We know that we are. And that our sin actually does not mean that we're not. Oh, but Lord, would you help us confess? And would you let us and help us be real and authentic? And would you, would you escort us towards growth and grace? And Lord, would you build your kingdom? in this world, and would you make your kingdom come. In Jesus' name, amen.